Oh boy, my new game. Let's see everything I need to play. Okay, we've got the measuring tip. We've got the dice and the dice tray. We have a box full of tokens. We've got some templates. We've got some, upgrade. we've got the terrain book. We've got the laser pointer. We've got, we've got army cards. We've got some bundles of action cards that come with tactics and there's loads we've of We've got them. the rule book. We've got the more useful supplement rule book that comes in a more convenient package. The movement we've tool. The we've got the range band. We've got, we've the, got the necessary tie-in novel. We've got the turn counter. Can't forget your place, so okay? We've got the salt. We've got the proprietary dice. We've got the Whatever we've got the instructional VHS tip. We've, we've got, got the, the notebook for keeping notes. We've got the mobile phone for the official app. We've got the mobile phone for the better unofficial app. And finally, we have the FAQs. Okay, what else do we need? Oh no, I forgot the miniatures. Hey everyone, my name is Discourse, and today we're going to talk about widgets. Wait, wait, I, I think this might actually be interesting. So Kill Team Octarius has recently launched, and I would say that most people are broadly enjoying it, especially the new kits. The Orc Commandos and the Death Corps of Krieg have gone down pretty well in the community. It's nice to see my Maginot line French boys finally joining their resin brothers, and criticisms of the game have been minor. Every combination of weapons should have been available, GW. And okay, this isn't the point of the video, but damn that 45 arm. Anyway, not content to sell you measuring tape, the new kill team comes with a specific movement gauge. And this is a required tool to play kill team. Because rather than measuring anything using Arabic numerals, Games Workshop are now using hieroglyphs. So this paradigm shift, that is to say changing measurements from inches into random shapes, was met with quite a lot of anger from the community as it emerged during the marketing of the game. But this was met with a pretty loud counter response that consisted of essentially, oh my god, get over it. Which, I mean, okay, I suppose. Anyway, at the time, this wasn't something that I myself was too concerned about. I was just hoping that the use of these symbols would be explained in the game design and that this measurement gauge would serve some sort of purpose. And now that it has come out and I've read the rules, well, eesh. So Games Workshop aren't actually the pioneers of this school of design. The most excessive use of proprietary widgets has to be from Fantasy Flight, most notably in their Star Wars Legion game. Now, I like Star Wars Legion. I think it's really fun and enjoyable. I think it's really designed well, too. And I would argue that generally speaking, it probably plays quite a bit better than Warhammer 40k. It is more modern and accessible, and it comes with a lot of innovations like managing initiative and alternating activations. These are great, and they really add to the experience of the game. But at every step of the design in Star Wars Legion, you can see a legacy of board game design and the fingerprints of executive meddling. It uses strange exotic dice, some white, some red. A bizarre range band system that has no use for numbers or measurements. A peculiar movement system that awkwardly shunts units around in straight lines. And this spoils the game a little bit for me. On the one hand, a lot of these tools are pretty tactile. There is something very oddly satisfying about a completely blank-sided die. It just feels so clean and pure. But on the other hand, like, why? For example, the white defense dice are basically a roll of 6+, plus, and the red defense die are basically a roll of 4+. Plus. So, sorted, you could use normal dice. And okay, I'll give you the use of the measurement tool, there is some utility in that, but just barely, and only really for vehicles. And the range bands could have just been rulers. And so, there is a lot of proprietary assets in this game that I think serve simply to obfuscate game mechanics. But if we go back further than Star Wars Legion, Fantasy Flight actually tried this before in the third edition of the Warhammer Fantasy RPG. All the way back in 2009. Doesn't, doesn't feel that long ago to me. I remember those days. Now in a lot of ways, this is owed to Fantasy Flight's board game heritage, and the general culture in that space for bespoke systems that come in the box. But the third edition of the Warhammer Fantasy RPG was pretty egregious in what it came bundled with. It came with special dice, special tokens, range bands, and then these special action cards. Remind you of anything? And this all served to create a closed ecosystem for players. 
Now, I can't help but view this pretty cynically and say that it was motivated to some extent by the design to pull players into a curated ecosystem and increase the potential number of products that the company could sell. Now, we never really saw the final form of this kind of closed ecosystem because of how hostile players were to the idea. It basically never got enough of a foothold in the barren winter that was the RPG community. But no doubt there would have been plenty of card expansion packs and extra tats that you could have picked up for the game if it had have been initially successful. So why? Why did this design type feel? Why did tabletop RPG players just not get on board with this style of curated game and this avenue of monetization? Well, it was utterly derided in the community, it was mocked for the changes, and there was basically a strong, cogent response from the community. And due to that backlash, it was just a really hard game to market. And now we have the fourth edition of the Warhammer Fantasy RPG that is far superior and has done away with all of these systems. Now in contrast to the Warhammer Fantasy RPG, Star Wars Legion has adopted the same similar types of widgets and cards pretty uncontroversially, and now Kill Team 2nd Edition is the same. Games Workshop have added new ways to monetize the same game without adding any value to the experience. And so there are widgets and cards just like in Warhammer Fantasy. And for all intents and purposes, Games Workshop have been pretty successful in this inclusion. It has been adopted pretty uncontroversially by miniature wargamers. The discourse amongst players is one of broad acceptance. So what makes these two products different? So firstly, and it would be pretty remiss of me now not to contextualize this, but the scale of change is different. Warhammer Fantasy changed pretty significantly between 2nd edition and 3rd. But I mean, a lot has changed between the 1st edition of Kill Team and the 2nd. So importantly, I think it all hinges on expectations from consumers. Compared to tabletop RPG players, we as miniature wargamers expect to be sold to. We expect upsold products. We also expect to have to buy additional peripheral items in order to enjoy our hobby. And while tabletop RPG players also expect to need some tools to enjoy their hobby, using for example pen and paper as opposed to measuring tape and glue. Miniature wargamers, however, expect these things to come at a premium price. I mean, imagine trying to sell some special measuring tools to an RPG role player for $35. It just couldn't happen. But those expectations didn't emerge from nowhere. They were cultivated, grown and tended to, just as Samwise Gamgee tended to the gardens of the Baggins. Only instead of love, care, and an unhealthy breaking of boundaries, this marketplace was tended to with malice, profit optimization, and an unhealthy breaking of boundaries. Oh, I guess Games Workshop and Samwise Gamgee both have that in common. But yes, our expectations as consumers have been subtly shaped by the incremental changes in the miniature wargaming marketplace, largely by Games Workshop. And what Games Workshop do is a result of what they think the market will bear. It's a cycle. Games Workshop push the margins of acceptability, and that shapes what we will find acceptable in the future. In this way, the market becomes distorted. So basically, when compared to the tabletop RPG marketplace, these bespoke peripherals found an environment much more conducive to growth in the miniature wargaming market. If the tabletop RPG G marketplace was a barren field, the miniature wargaming one has been tended to with a lot of fertilizer. So yes, of course, predictably, Games Workshop are the villain once again. I mean, sorry, but the uncomfortable truth for players of the various Warhammer games is that Games Workshop really have earned this spot in the rogues gallery, because they have indeed fostered a marketplace where it is now acceptable to arbitrarily change the concept of measuring distance in inches into a series of strange and unusual shapes, ones that bear no relationship to the numbers they are supposedly meant to represent. There is nothing immediately intuitive about the change from numbers to shapes, which is what makes it so perplexing to me. Every time I read the Kill Team rulebook, I am confused once again. I have to do maths in my head. Oh, it's a pentagon. Oh wait, how far is that? Oh right, it's six inches. A quick mental arithmetic as my synapses once again try to make a tenuous connection between what's on the page and what I already know. That is a convoluted experience every time. It takes me longer to comprehend the rules and quality of objects and distances. It is, broadly speaking, an irksome experience. Because numbers are pretty universal. They are accessible to a lot of people. These shapes are confusing. So what does their introduction serve? Before it was released, the most common refrain was that these shapes would be required in the rules in some capacity. That shapes, rather than numbers, would be needed. Very similar to the broad, more defensible justification of proprietary assets in Star Wars Legion where movement of vehicles is defined by the angles that the movement widget can make. So I have been awaiting this revelatory experience. And yet, to my not complete surprise, I must admit there is no explanation to be found. No reason listed in the rules or anything that is done better by the use of these shapes. All they do is sabotage the game by getting in the way. 
And is that the goal of this? Well, as much as I think that the rules for Games Workshop games can sometimes be Byzantine and difficult to parse, I have to think that it is not the intention of designers to make their game difficult to understand. And for context, I don't think that Games Workshop write very good rules. I think they are complicated and often bloated, and they are used as an excuse to sell supplements. I tolerate this for some games. Necromunda is a good example. I adore this game, but I don't know why. The rules aren't very good and the gameplay is poor. Still, I love my Escher gang. I have enjoyed all the campaigns I've played in it, even where they felt frustrating, because sometimes it feels like I am enjoying the game in spite of itself. But with that said, I don't believe that the designers are maliciously sabotaging their own system, nor are they so incompetent that they cannot design well. I just believe that they are under certain constraints that don't affect other designers. Because they have a legacy to uphold, and this provides attention when they seek to innovate the design of their games in any way. I have not played Kill Team Octarius yet, but it is almost transcendent in how it innovates on the current Warhammer formula. It is truly distinct from its parent. This, in my mind, is a good thing. I have grown increasingly dissatisfied with my inability to interrupt my opponent's actions in the standard 40k game, and the stratagems that have been introduced to that game are a poor facsimile for mere alternating activation. But Kill Team brings in alternating activations, and it finally breaks past the paradigm of rolling a single d6 multiple times to see if one can finally injure their opponent's model. It seems less swingy, and I hope that Kill Team Octarius feels like a more consistent, smoother game. From all that I have read, that appears to be the case. I look forward to playing it. And for all that, it is clear that the designers took a lot of care with this game, and they have poured a lot of love into it. So no, I do not think that the designers are attempting to sabotage their own game. And yet, I have tried and tried to discern why these movement widgets were needed within the logic of the game in the first place. It feels like a vestigial product, like the need for it was lost along the way, but that it, for whatever reason, was still included in the final game. But why? And having exhausted the design or gameplay reasons for its inclusion, and being pretty satisfied that the designers of the game aren't incompetent, I can only turn my attention to other considerations, and such considerations I have no real sympathy for. Is it merely for pure profiteering? Is this just the logical conclusion of a series of steps Games Workshop have already been down? Is this just the next step in a road that has been well trod by Games Workshop? It started with their first party product. Yes, I need clippers, glues, paints, and measuring tape. Thank you. This was convenient. All here at my local GW store, right where I buy the miniatures. That makes sense. It is overpriced, but it is convenient. Fine, we would expect them to sell the tools needed to play their game, but every hobbyist eventually realizes that hey, there are other brands. If I put in a modicum of effort, I can actually save substantial money here. But in the case of Kill Team, Games Workshop aren't really giving you that option. You can't go to a tool store and just buy a Kill Team widget. I should know, I've tried, they really had no idea what I wanted. Hey, I need a sort of half plate with a triangle on it, you know? And I suspect that the shapes on these tools are designed to make them exclusive to this game. Every other game uses numbers, comprehensible, reliable digits that have really stood the test of time. Like seriously, numbers are very useful. But Kill Team uses symbols. It has a language to it now. This model can move a triangle. This model can move three circles. In a vacuum, you would be confused. These sentences would make no sense to you. But Games Workshop can make tools with circles, triangles, and squares on them. They will sell those to you now. Another chance to charge for more. To increase the value and consequently the price of their Kill Team Essentials kit. That will be $35, please. And no doubt that the next game to use it will be different from Kill Team. Perhaps it will take this experiment further. That would be great for GW because then you'd need a different tool. Another Essentials kit to buy. That's double the money. Or they could use the same tool again, but this time begin selling more expensive versions of it with higher margins. This is another opportunity to sell. Games Workshop have created a product that you need to buy in order to play, but which doesn't add any real value. And it really was no effort at all. They just changed a few numbers into a few shapes. I mean, sure, it made the game worse, but that's a small price to pay for money. And our only discourse on this, the reviews and commentators have treated this as a strange quirk, a curiosity in the game and filed it under a... 
That's weird. Anyway, these models are cool. And I think that's a problem. It means that next time a specialty game comes out from Games Workshop, we should expect more widgets and strange, unintuitive shapes. Perhaps mechanics will be created that require the addition of more bloating up an otherwise pretty streamlined and efficient game. I just can't help but compare this to when a new video game launches and you can see a big obvious store tab in the background of the main menu. Even if there's nothing to buy yet, the intentions are clear. So we return to the central question. Why did the Warhammer Fantasy RPG fail where Star Wars Legion and Kill Team succeed? It is because, as miniature wargaming consumers, we are used to this naked profiteering now. It is not exceptional to us, where RPG players mock the use of additional peripherals and return to their pen and paper leaving the game to die, we are instead resigned to our fates. We have paid our obol and taken the boat with Charon. We are now sailing down the river Styx, unsure of how we got here. But our destination is known. We know where we're going. Thanks for joining me today, everyone. It was nice to have an excuse to touch on Star Wars Legion today. I've actually played it quite a lot, and I hope to touch on it again in future, alongside some other games. So if you want to check that out, why not subscribe to the channel to get updated in future? And also hit the like button if you did enjoy this content. I have also set up a Discord if you want to come check that out. The link is in the description of this video. And a big thank you to my first Patreon members, Burning Wreck and Alignment Inc. Thank you for the support. And if you'd like your name in the credit of these videos and to help support what we're doing here, as well as get access to all sorts of behind the scenes commentary and special Discord rooms, please check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash discourse miniatures. And I hope that you join me in the next video. Bye bye Seriously though, why didn't they just print numbers on the sides of the widgets? It's so frustrating. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Almost irrationally, I hate it. So just to clarify, I do actually really like movement gauges as a rule. I have a lot of acrylic versions. My issue with the Kill Team peripheral is that it has random shapes. That it is unintuitive and really obtrusive and completely obfuscates a really core system movement.